Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome from in wherever you are in the world watching this. And Rahul is my name. I'm one of the emergency physicians at Changi Hospital in Singapore. And thanks to Jade and the committee for having me. We'll be talking a little bit about the practicalities of moving children, or in some of us call them small adults. Um, don't get too annoyed, pediatricians. They are for emergency medicine purposes and resuscitation purposes. Disclaimers first, when you uh, come to a conference, don't believe everything you hear, including what I say. Always use your clinical judgment and experience when you see a case in context with their values, especially when they have children or parents, and uh, use the updated, most relevant scientific evidence. In another life, I used to fly with the uh, retrieval service in Western Australia called the Royal Flying Doctor Service. And yes, this is just an opportunity to show off some pictures, but also showing you that sometimes recess or critical care can happen in a shack. And um, apart from the view, um, you had to resuscitate critically ill patients and move them long, long distances. This is generally mobile ICU with tubes and lines and monitors and all sorts of implements going in and out of the patient, which has to move across a distance. Now these principles, which we're gonna talk about, are similar to moving patients in your hospital. And it might be very similar um, when it's moving smaller patients. There is a proviso though. I got humbled um, just when I thought I knew something, which I don't, when I saw one of these things. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a neonate. Um, I'm convinced that neonates are not from this planet. They're from the planet Neptune. because They have oxygen requirements, which are different. They sleep differently when they're critically ill. Their sugar requirements are different. Their temperature requirements are different. And everything I know, I learned from the nurse, which was just out of the picture over there. And uh, my advice on this is uh, whenever you see a, a patient from Neptune, just call a doctor from Neptune, which is a neonatologist, um, and you'll be much better off. Back on planet Earth, um, car crashes do occur, and sometimes they involve children. If you think that your ED is safe from any of these things, you are not. I'm sure there will be a time where small children or any sort of small adult comes through the door, and this one came through our door. Little details have been changed, but the case is real. Pretty much a unrestrained passenger and a child, and things were looking pretty bad. How bad? Well, if those of you who have uh, sort of known a little bit about uh, pediatric vital signs will show or see that this is a real startling BP and almost certainly signifies some sort of intracranial trouble um, and this patient needed to be moved. It's always good to have some issues listed down for those of you who are training to do exams. Crystallizing things into issues is a, a very good idea when you have a complex case. So critically ill child requiring a few things, resuscitation, obviously, imaging, if you have it in your hospital, intervention of some sort, if you have pediatric surgeons or neurosurgeons, and then a theater, which might require pediatric anesthetists or pediatrically trained anesthetists. So what is definitive care? when a child comes to an adult center, which is not fitted out or kitted out for pediatrics. Well, it might be different where you work or in your country, but for us, it turned out that this definitive place was a pediatric tertiary institute, which was about 20 minutes away. But principles are more important um, when it comes to moving um, children or any sort of patient. And this is my office space a long time ago. Um, highly recommend the job, by the way, if anybody wants to do it. Principles, though, are the same wherever you are in whatever job you do in terms of moving patients. Moving a patient to definitive care, either being interventional radiology or the gastro suite or theater or even to ICU or even moving to another hospital has certain problems associated with it. Primarily, the level of care shouldn't drop. If you're being treated in an intensive care critical facility, you shouldn't be going to another place in a normal non-kitted ambulance, which doesn't have resuscitation capabilities. If you're moving somebody who's been treated by 
specialist consultants all this time, you shouldn't be moving this patient in the care of a junior nurse or an intern per se. So the level of care must be maintained. When you move patients, just like that picture we showed you earlier about the mobile ICU, the patient's got to be packaged in the sense that supportive care, files, parents, proper analgesia, all these things have to be moved along in the same time speedily. Ideally, you don't want to do anything en route. And that's one of the really, really golden rules of retrieval of transport medicine. You don't want to be intubating on the way. You don't want to be inserting cannulas or central lines on the way. The best transfer is the no fuss or minimal fuss transfer. You don't want to have drama on the way. You prefer all that drama before you leave. And that's where the principles of preparing come into play. Are you prepared for trouble? Do you have redundancy? Redundancy means things that are extra, which you brought along just in case. Do you have that second line when one fails? Is that line accessible and near you and not two feet away from you? Can your monitors be seen clearly? Do you have backup batteries? Is this refill of analgesia adequate to sustain the transport time? Have you talked to who you're coming to? Have, do they know when you're arriving? Was there a problem on the way which they're aware of? All these things require proper prior planning, not just when you have to move the patient. and has to be forethought for it. But some things you can't plan for, unfortunately. One of those things um, is like this, where we had a puncture when we were transporting a child with pneumonia. Thankfully, we had already dropped the child off and this picture was taken on the way back to the airport. So serendipity sometimes. You just can't plan for everything. Back to the case though, there's always a little thought about being adequately resuscitated versus how critically you have to move the patient in terms of time. Is the blood pressure something that's really concerning? If it is concerning, what's the pathophysiology behind it? Is the blood pressure going to get better or not better with the pathology which is ongoing? In this case, you've got intracranial trauma. And if definitive care, i.e. surgery, is not given, or medical intervention, i.e. lowering blood pressure, is not given in time, nothing you're going to do in that transport is going to make things any better. So decisions have to be made in terms of time with the pros and cons of moving this patient. And I agree, this is not easily done when there's lots of people involved in different teams and specialities. But my advice to this is listen to experience and um, gather the most amount of experience you can with your team members around you. So this case eventuated in the sense that we had a secure airway in place. As you know, point of care ultrasound has limited utility in children. Yes, ideally, we could um, figure out whether there was uh, anything wrong with the abdomen or pelvis, but this patient required moving and CT um, for definitive imaging. Supportive care in terms of analgesia and monitoring and comms were in place, but who goes? It's a hospital which is busy. Does the consultant who's looking after the department go? And if they do, who's going to look after the department? You might have other constraints or resources in your unit or whatever department you work in. Who goes? Is it someone who's middle grade and may be able to handle the situation? Or is it someone who does not need to make serious decisions in the department that goes? Difficult question once again. But these questions shouldn't be solved on that day itself. Now, I know you have to solve them on that day, but they shouldn't come up. Improvements have to be done way before time if you have situations like these. And there are systems in place which you can implement them. Firstly, staff, who goes and why, needs to be trained. Nurses especially need to be trained. You can't send somebody on the first outing who has never dealt with a child before. 
Similarly for junior doctors, why would you send someone who has barely a grasp of adult medicine to handle critical care pediatrics? Now, is your system streamlined in the sense that you have a clear line of communication, protocolization of your drugs, medications, processes to move, ambulances, ordering ambulances? And when you have the system, do you have a way of reducing error in it? Or do you even have a way of detecting error? Because auditing only is as good as the system that's in place. If you're not going to detect anything, everything's perfect. This is a great slide from uh, Department of Veterans Affairs in the US, which shows to some people's dismay that certain things which they thought worked really don't play out in real life. The data from years and years of observing this is that education, reminders, sending emails, a little bit of simulation here and there, is not as effective as things like standardization and forcing functions. And we'll get a little bit to that in a short while. But the point is that human beings cannot be trusted when it comes to a crisis. Don't rely on your memory or other person's memory when it comes to critical situations and crisis mode. What we mean by that sometimes is uh, demonstrated by stuff. So do you remember exact things in the Broslow tape? I don't. Do you have a specific place where you can store pediatric equipment? We do. In fact, we didn't even trust our calculations to the point that we, if you look on the left side, where we used to calculate stuff, after a while, realizing that writing it down or distributing it by weight was far easier. So you force someone to look at that and errors are reduced. Similarly, why scramble for stuff when you can prepare it prior to the problems? Now these inter-hospital bags are also stored in our intensive care as well as our cardiac units for critical patients moving to various portions of the hospital, not just inter-hospital, but intra-hospital as well. And it forces people to have a look at what's inside with a bit of education and training and checklisting, you get safer outcomes. Once again, auditing is really important. So when you are transferring patients, you can't just wing it. It has to be well recorded, problems have to be tracked down, any issues solved as we move along because problems do occur. And they don't just occur with junior people, they happen with senior staff as well. And you learn from these things, just like this case taught us quite a few things as well. These are the times that we live in where junior staff are the ones manning the hospital at night. And so you cannot expect um, junior surgical staff or junior nurses to transfer patients in which they're not used to or pediatricians are not available and anesthetists aren't able to take um, patients to our theater. So this patient had to go to a tertiary Pete's hospital and it was transported by an ED physician who happened to be the most senior physicians on in the hospital at night after hours and ventilated prior to transfer with no issues. The transfer itself had no problems, got a CT and went to a neurosurgery a neurosurgical theater at the destination, had the intracranial pathology sorted. And believe it or not, I'm sure most of you do believe this because children recover quite well when pathologies are removed, had a good functional outcome despite that car crash. So it does beg the question, what should you do when you have problems like different environments? Because this is what transferring is all about. You're putting somebody in a different environment. So problems are expected. It's not something that's just going to resolve by itself. Well, just think about what you're doing. You're sending junior staff in a moving claustrophobic ambulance in a case which they're not familiar with 
in an age group that they're not familiar with, and with equipment that they're unfamiliar with, drug doses which they're not aware of, and you're expecting a good outcome. Now, just remember that in a crisis, people don't rise to the occasion just out of coincidence. They generally fall to their level of training. So beware of what you're sending in terms of training and the pathology in front of you. It's the environment that's the issue. They're not used to it. So if you're not used to it, you need to change the system that you're having. In summation, got to have forcing functions which allow you to reduce errors, even though sometimes junior staff in certain situations have to go. I admit it's not always going to be the consultant that goes, but you must have safety nets, and safety nets are in the form of checklists and forcing functions. And just a reminder that even though this was a talk about moving inter-hospitally, it's the same thing when you're moving patients in and around your departments in your hospital. Once again, thanks for listening. If you need to contact me for anything I may have confused you with or other questions, these are my contact points. Um, if you want to know more about transport or if you want to attend a course on critical transport, this website's the one I host. Um, if you're into emergency medicine, um, this is my Twitter account, as well as a blog for emergency medicine. Thanks again. Enjoy the conference and take care.